Hello everyone and welcome back. I finally did another video. Anyway, sorry it took so long, but now that I'm finally on spring break, I may get things done. So anyway, I hope you enjoy, and today's episode is all about culture and geography in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. So let's get to it. Alright, today I'll be doing mostly what I did the last two times, placing Sinnoh on a map and finding some culture behind it. Rewatching my last two videos, I realize I kinda go on too long about geography and realize that can be a little boring, so I'll try to give you more cultural segments this time and some cool things about the Pokemon found in Sinnoh, so here we go. Now before we get going too fast, let's place Sinnoh's real life equivalent on a map. Sinnoh's real life equivalent is Yokaido, Japan, the head of the dragon in the Japanese archipelago. See it? No? Hmm. How about now? It's a pretty big giveaway right off the bat, and as always, that's just the surface, so let's get down to business. Now, while doing research for this generation, it has turned out to be one of the most culturally based generations in all the Pokemon games, and it's really made me come to appreciate these games more than I have in the past. First though, let's get a few more examples to confirm the geography of Sinnoh and Yokaido. Yokaido is characterized by a few key things. Number one, the center of the island has a large number of mountains and volcanic plateaus. Number two, there are coastal plains in all directions. And number three, agriculture and other primary industries, industries that revolve around the direct use of natural resources, like mining and farming, play a large role in Yokaido's economy. So let's see if things line up. Well, first, the volcanic plateaus in the center. Easily a clear candidate for Mount Cornet, which runs right through the middle of Sinnoh. Number two, the coastal plains. Well, other than Mount Cornet, Sinnoh is particularly flat. Take, for example, Pastoria City. We can link this place to the coastal plains and marshes found all across the coastline of Yokado. Now, number three, the primary activities. Well, two towns are a dead giveaway in Sinnoh. The first is Solacion Town, and it's a perfect example of farming, the biggest economic activity here, as there is a lot of farmland and happens to be where the Pokemon daycare is. Another prime example, get it, because primary activities? No, uh, sorry. Anyway, Orberg City is another example of mining, a primary activity, an example fulfilling our number three requirement. All things considered, geographically these places line up. Pretty cool, right? Well, now that we have location out of the way, let's move on to some culture. Now, like I said, Generation 4's Pokemon have tons of great examples. Let's start with Bronzor and Bronzong. These guys gotta have something good, right? Well, turns out Bronzong is based off a of Dotaku, or Japanese bell, which is believed to have been used to pray for good harvests. Matches up to our farming economy, right? Anyway, these bells were made out of bronze, which is where we see our name come from. The fact that Bronzong evolves from Bronzor though, which is said to represent a bronze mirror, links these Pokemon to an old Japanese myth about a bell and a mirror. The priests of an old town in Japan wanted to forge a bell for their temple, so they asked the local woman to donate their bronze mirrors for the cause. A woman contributed her mirror but later regretted it. Because of her repentance, the mirror wouldn't melt in the furnace until she killed herself? Wait, what? It's a little dramatic, but okay, I guess we'll keep going. Before her suicide, she said that whoever would break the bell would be given a great wealth by her ghost. A multitude of people tried to break the bell by ringing it furiously, but none could. So the tired priest managed to roll it down a hill into a swamp where it was never seen again. Anyway, that's where we can see the pr transition from Bronze Mirror to Bronze Bell, linking these two Pokemon to a pretty cool myth. It's a weird way to start off, but we have a lot more to go, so let's get going. Next up, we have Frostlass, one of my all-time favorite Pokemon. This icy ghost type is based off the Yuki Ono, a Japanese spirit, and may I add a quite terrifying one. Our first evidence comes right from Frostlass's Japanese name, Yuki Minoko. See the similarities? Yuki Ono translates roughly to Snow Woman, and rightly so. Folklore goes that Yuki Ono appears on snowy nights as a tall, beautiful woman with long black hair and blue lips. 
Her inhumanely pale, or even transparent in some cases, skin makes her blend into the snowy landscape. Although these descriptions don't match Frostlass all too well, it's the next two that really show the similarities. She sometimes wears a white kimono and is said to float above the floor, leaving no footprints in the snow. Sound familiar? Or should I say, look familiar? Now there's tons of different stories surrounding this spirit, but a pretty good one, and scary may I add, is on the National Dex channel. I'll link the video in the description, and you can go hear it there. Anyway, we'll keep going. Anyway, enough with the small Pokemon, let's move on to something big, the creation duo and their master. Palkia and Dialga are theorized to be based on the Shinto legend Inzami and Inzangi. Many fans link these two to the Shinto creation story, but before we compare the two, I'll give you a brief summary of the myth. Inzangi and Inzami Inzangi and Inzami were the central deities in the Japanese creation myth Shinto. They were the eighth pair of brother and sister gods to appear after heaven and earth were separated out of chaos. By standing on a floating bridge of heaven and stirring the ocean with a heavenly jeweled spear, they created the first landmass. The story goes on to have these two marry and have a child who's deformed, remarry to fix the problem that led to the first child being deformed, then have a second child whose birth causes Inzami, the girl, to be forced to the underworld, and then the two deities divorce. Now that's an extremely shortened version of the story, but I'm just giving you background, so it's okay. If you want to know more though, a quick google search of their names will tell you all you need to know about them. Now, how do these guys relate? Well, the first giveaway is that they used a spear to create the islands. A big coincidence is that the place these legendaries are found is called Spear Pillar. Also, they were said to be standing on a floating bridge, and floating above Spear Pillar is the Hall of Origin. Pretty similar, right? Now, distinguishing which legendary is Zangi or which is Zami is pretty blurred, and it's hard to say which would be which. And it's hard to say with certainty that these guys are based off the myth, considering they're both genderless legendaries, so they're probably not married. Well, probably. As for Arceus, there really is no distinct origin for this thing. Or whatever it is. The theories range from Egyptian to Chinese, but it seems to take more of a monotheistic appearance, such as those in Christianity and Judaism, as a supreme ruler and one true god. However, his name has some cool origins, so I guess we'll look at that. Although there's many theories for the origin of this name, my favorites are the combination of the Greek word Archon, which means ruler or lord, and Deus, the Latin word for god. There's tons more and I can go on forever, but these two are my favorite, so sorry I guess. Anyway, that's all I got for culture and geography in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, but if you have something I left out, make sure to leave it in the comment section below. And if you want to see other videos I did like this on culture and Pokemon X and Y and culture and Pokemon Red and Blue, you can click the links or annotations right here if I figure out how to do them. Anyway, hopefully I'll be making more content soon, so stay tuned for that, I guess. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.